You are listening to You and the Truth, where we will give you the truth face to face. Now what you do with it is up to you. Hi there, everybody. This is Corinna Schmidt, and you are watching You and the Truth. I'm here today presenting you again, uh, Mike McCormick. He was with us in November when we talked about Joe Biden unauthorized and his book by that title, Joe Biden Unauthorized. We're back with uh, Mike McCormick. Welcome. And how are you? Thanks, Corinne. It's great to be here. We've got a big day. Yes, we do indeed. So we're going to be talking about some of the developments that have happened since um, you were on the show last time, and you have spent an awful lot of time on the laptop of Hunter Biden and investigating what has uh, been hidden on that. Um, now, I want to talk about uh, the matter of Ukraine and the, the war between Russia and Ukraine right now, because it's a really big issue, not only for Americans, but certainly also for Europeans, as the war is very close to them. And, you know, many are worried that it's going to spread. Now, war doesn't just come out of the blue. We know that. It's something that's in the works. It's being planned for a long time. It takes manpower, materials, and all sorts of things to get that going. So we know it just didn't happen out of the blue. But here's the thing. Um, Biden and the Obama administration, they have supposedly been involved in this matter for years. And it's my understanding that through your research, you have uncovered this involvement going back about eight years. Can you talk to us about that, please? Yes, absolutely. And it's an inch. I, one of the reasons I said it's a big day is because the Hunter Biden laptop was officially validated by the New York Times and reporting they did today on a story about Hunter Biden's, uh, an investigation of Hunter Biden's tax evasion that he's going to quote unquote rectify. There's a lot of really sleazy stuff that's in that laptop, and I don't look at that. What I look at is I worked for Joe Biden for six years from 2011 through 2017 as his stenographer. I listened to everything he said to the press. I traveled with him. I traveled with him to Ukraine three times. I traveled with him to Moscow, uh, Russia, and saw him publicly humiliated by Vladimir Putin. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So my knowledge of what Joe Biden and Barack Obama, I was in that in their White House, so I also traveled with Barack Obama on some trips. Um, how they viewed Russia, how they viewed Ukraine, how they got stuck in it. And then I went into the laptop and I started pulling up Hunter Biden's perspective. And when I wrote my book, I was looking at uh, information. The, the book is Joe Biden Unauthorized and the 2020 Crack Up of the Democratic Party. It's on Amazon. You can buy it on my website, www.joebidenunauthorized.com. And I wrote an entire chapter there basically about Joe Biden and his sketchy business in Ukraine with Hunter. And part of that was I came across some White House meetings that were um, highlighted in White House visitor logs that included uh, Barack Obama, David Axrod, Jim Messina, and David Plouffe in 2014 in April. And then out of that meeting, David Axrod was sent to the Naval Observatory to talk to Joe Biden. And this was just days before he went to Ukraine. So it's not just that Joe Biden was involved in Ukraine. It was the Obama White House knew it and was covering up it up. So how exactly let's were start they... with the how exactly were they involved in the Ukraine matter? And how does that tie into what's going on today with the war? So in the back of my book, I have a timeline of Joe Biden's involvement in Ukraine. It actually goes back to 2009. His first trip, he took six trips to Ukraine. His first trip was summer of 2009. He went over there. He actually got uh, Vladimir Putin very angry at him. Remember at the time, Putin was the president of Russia, but then he took sort of like a, a step back job as the prime minister of Russia and Medvedev came in. So Biden comes over, he goes to Ukraine and he makes a speech about how we're not gonna, the new, this, our new Obama administration is not gonna stand for other countries being subjected to spheres of influence. And Putin took that really bad. 
The other thing that Biden did on that trip was he started talking about Ukrainian energy security because Putin had been threatening Ukraine with energy. You know, they have a huge pipeline uh, that goes Russian natural gas through Ukraine into uh, Ukraine uses it for their heating, but they also get some money from it and it goes into Europe. So Putin was threatening to shut that off and it was harming foreign relations for Ukraine. They were basically beholden to uh, Russia for that. So Biden wanted to fix that. So he got his hands on this. He, he started this White House uh, group on Ukrainian energy security, 2009. He knew who the players were. Fast forward to 2014, there's a lot of unrest in December 20, uh, 2013. There's um, massive public demonstrations, the Maidan revolution it becomes known as. The your current uh, president of Ukraine at the time, a guy named Yanukovych, was drifting towards Russia. Putin, he was a Putin pu puppet. The U.S., there was a uh, pretty well-known, at the end of January, I think, a well-known um, release of an a intercepted phone call between the um, ambassador in Ukraine and a guy named Jeffrey Pyatt and a woman from the State Department named Victoria Newland, And they're discussing this Maidan revolution and how they support it. At the end of the phone call, Joe Biden's name comes up as the guy who wants to come in and fix this. And it's mentioned to them by Jake Sullivan, who's now Joe Biden's um, national security advisor. So this is 2014, January, late. In uh, 2014, February, this, can't, this a very significant event took place where basically Vladimir Putin, the, the belief was that it was the Russians who released this phone call, but there, no one's really sure. Ukraine might have released it too. In 2014, February 14th, Valentine's Day, there is a red flag uh, money transfer, three and a half million dollars from Moscow, the mayor of Moscow's wife, a woman named um, Yelena Baturina, she transfers three and a half million dollars to a company that's that has three people in it: Hunter Biden, his business partner Devin Archer, who's now under who's been convicted and facing prison time for a separate uh, fraud, securities fraud, and John Kerry, who was then the Secretary of State, his stepson Chris Hines. Those are the three people in that company. They get three and a half million dollars from basically one of Vladimir Putin's best friends. Money goes in. It's red flagged by the um, Treasury Department. No one hears about it for months, years actually. It wasn't until the Senate investigated, Republicans in the Senate investigated and released a report just before the 2020 election. If that report is red flagged in the Treasury Department, I guarantee Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and John Kerry knew about it within 24 hours. The Treasury Department is right next to the White House. They would have had a senior official of that department walk literally across East Executive Avenue into the West Wing and probably told the White House chief of staff, hey, look. And then they would have gone to the vice president's chief of staff and said, hey, look, this is what came in. No one said anything. It was kept under wraps. Six days later, Joe Biden makes a phone call because there's a murder, there's a, a shooting that's un, being undertaken on the peaceful protesters in the Maidan. Snipers are shooting them, are shooting at them. They're apparently government sponsored snipers by this Yanukovych guy. Joe Biden gets on the phone, says, stop the shooting, stop the killing in the Maidan. A hundred people are killed. They're now called the Heavenly Hundred. They do stop the shooting. Yanukovych leaves. The Maidan revolution sweeps a new government into place. Joe Biden soon goes on to become, quote unquote, the savior of Ukraine. It, he goes into a very strong relationship, and we now know this, mm -hmm. thanks to Hunter Biden, um, with the laptop, with Barista Holdings. And this is the uh, Ukrainian natural energy company that Joe um, says he had no business with. 
I think he put uh, Hunter Biden in place in that thing. I think it started in February 2014. There's some emails and I'll be writing more Substack. So I write a Substack report. It's called Midnight in the Laptop of Good and Evil. Do you think and Joe I'll Biden writing has, a Substack about, has a financial interest himself personally in, uh, in the Burisma Holding Company? Yes, he does. Do he we, has do that have, financial interest in... What kind of evidence do we have of that besides um hearsay well so the evidence is there was this yelena batterina continues these payments to hunter biden all the way through 2015. then there is um so she makes about two hundred thousand dollars total payments to this thornton group and most of the money goes through the Thornton Group to another company that then just suddenly declares bankruptcy and no one's really sure what happens to the money. In the laptop, there's a, a evidence of um, a meeting that uh, Hunter Biden and Devin Archer had with her in Italy. They were supposed to meet with her in Italy and have, and this is 2014, this is April 2014. So the question is, what is the uh, what financial so these are, conver these are email conversations uh, that you have uncovered on the computer. I've seen the email and there's been other reporting on it. Um, there was a book written by uh, Miranda Devine called The Laptop from Hell and there's good reporting in there on it too. But I've seen these emails and uh, what I've also seen is, and I'll, I'll be writing a lot more on the Substack about that. Um, the latest Substack report I wrote was occurred in November, I just wrote it last week, it's on the Substack, and it's about a trip I took with Joe Biden into Ukraine in November 2014. Now, you're asking about his financial interests, and basically, there isn't really right now any, any firm evidence that Joe Biden benefited financially, personally, from payments into his pockets from Ukraine. Hunter Biden got a lot of money and that money was squandered on a variety of really sleazy activities. That's what's in the laptop. Cocaine use. Yeah, I was uh, just going to ask you, what kind of sleazy activities are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, any kind of weapons trading or drugs, um, paying for prostitutes? What are we talking about? Yeah, here? there's a lot of, he, he does, I mean, he does, he does, uh, pornography videos with prostitutes and puts them in his laptop. I don't look at those. The only thing I look in the laptop are the emails. Well, I mean, people have seen pictures that. that have been released uh, and put on, for example, Facebook and other social media, and they've taken down as fast as you possibly can put them up and then accuse right. the, uh, the Facebook user for sharing uh, inappropriate content. So you're being pointed at instead of Joe Biden, who is the sleazeball that recorded it in the first place. Right. And, and now that, you know, the, the argument that, uh, Twitter and, and, uh, Facebook had at the outset of the laptop exposures was this is, you know, fake news. This is a compromised material. This isn't real, but New York yeah, Times they were, today. They were claiming that it was photo. This is history. You know, this is American history. His sleazy lifestyle is American history. There's drug use. There's a lot of it. There's drug use with his dead brother's widow. And uh, I mean, just really sleazy stuff. And I stay away from that because I don't I don't want that in my life. So, but what I do know is what I saw and witnessed. So I went to Ukraine with Joe Biden in April, 2014. I went to Ukraine with Joe Biden in November, 2014. And I went to Ukraine with Joe Biden in December, 2015. And that's when he went and said, if you don't fire the prosecutor, I'm leaving without your, uh, you getting your uh, big billion dollar aid package. So those are the three trips I took. And your question was, what financial benefit did Joe Biden get from that? Yeah, there must have been something in it from him. I mean, for him. He must have gotten well, something out of it, I would imagine, right? My opinion is there was a very suspicious trip that occurred when Joe Biden went to Cyprus. Cyprus is the money laundering capital of Europe. It's the favorite 
place for money laundering for oligarchs of Russia and Ukraine. That's where Burisma Holdings is registered. A month after we talked a little bit about that to, uh, when you were on the show here in uh, November, that that's uh, where right. Burisma Holding is registered. Um, right. You mentioned to me what, before we uh, we got on the show here something about Joe Biden um having been dominated basically uh, by Putin since 2011 we we're, we're talking right. a lot about 2014 so how is it that he has been dominated by Putin since 2011 yeah let's turn let's let's turn the discussion towards the Ukraine war that's going on right now Russia invading Ukraine with Joe Biden sort of on the sidelines of this. And what I, uh, you know, one way I look at it is it's, it's like there's a couple of mafias and there's a war between two mafia families, Russian mafia versus Ukraine mafia, but there's a dirty cop that's letting it happen. And that dirty cop is Joe Biden. Joe Biden has a bad history. Is Remember Joe I told Biden you in he, a sense, not to interrupt, but is Joe Biden then in a sense the third dirty mafia that's involved here? Well, I would oh, put it more as a dirty, dirty cop. cop. <laughs> I don't know which is worse, being a dirty mafia or a dirty cop. Being a dirty cop, you know, you, you're basically standing back and seeing who wins, and then you take over when they're, right? Because, I mean, that's what I think of him, as a dirty cop. He's pretending that he's clean, but he's not behind mm -hmm. the scenes. And everybody knows who the mafia guys are, but nobody knows about the real cop. And that's who Joe Biden is. He's the dirty cop of this. And the reason I say that is, you know, he's, like I said, he started in 2009 with his Ukrainian energy thing. In 2011, he goes to Russia, and I wrote a substack about this, and I wrote actually a big chapter in my book about this, but Putin publicly humiliated him. Biden at the time wanted to make himself seem like this senior American statesman, he had all this experience. He goes into this meeting in Moscow, in the White House of Moscow, that's what it's called, the Russian right. White House, and he has this meeting with Putin, and Putin humiliates him. He basically, in the middle of a meeting with a lot of press in the room, he shuts off Joe Biden's microphone, shuts off all the television lights, and Joe Biden is left dumbstruck, sitting there with nothing to say. Well, he can't, he can't be Biden. heard, so it doesn't matter if he's talking. He right. can't be heard if you shut off his mic. Right. So after that, Biden, the next day, there's a leak into the Moscow Times that Biden had told everybody, I was in this meeting with Putin. I looked him in the eye. We did a private tour of, of his office. I looked him in the eye and said, I don't, I don't care about your soul. I don't think you have a soul. Because there was a, a famous uh, line that George Bush had, George W. Bush had when he met Putin. He said, I've looked into his soul and I think he's you know, a good person or something, or I think I can work with him. And so Biden wanted to make a comparison, but I'll get, a, sort of belittle what Bush had said, said, I looked into your soul, I don't think you have a soul. And Putin's, according to Biden, has said, good, then we have an understanding. Well, this past spring, Putin comes out and finally somebody asks him, did that ever happen? He goes, I don't remember it. And this was right before Putin and Biden had this uh, meeting in Geneva. So Putin comes out and says, I don't remember it. Biden has this statement and it starts getting into the US press. The first trip that I was on with Joe Biden in April 2014, he's flying back and he does an interview with the New Yorker magazine. In that interview, Joe Biden starts telling a story about all politics is personal. For instance, I had this meeting with, with Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin. It wasn't in the Kremlin, it was in the White House. But Joe Biden said to the reporter, I did it in the Kremlin. It got into the report in the magazine they had this, this meeting in the Kremlin where Joe Biden told Putin he didn't think he had a soul. So that gets printed in New Yorker magazine. Then it gets you, into further, think is, deeper into the press when this. What do you think is the purpose of that? him? What do you think is the purpose of him misrepresenting facts in such fashion? What does I, he I think he was lying and he forgot his lie. I think he forgot the origination of his lie. I don't think he ever had that that uh, conversation with Putin, and I think he completely, in his mind, so Putin was the got one that was telling the, the truth Kremlin when it would never happen. It happened in the Russian White House. The, so Putin was so, actually the one telling the truth, while 
uh, while uh, Biden is trying to paint a portrait of the Russian president as the liar. That's right. And and Putin knew that as of 2011. The, the report comes out in the Moscow Times the day after they have this embarrassing meeting where Putin humiliated him and where the Moscow Times said, and Biden said he looked into Putin's soul and said, told him he had no soul. So Putin knew based on reporting in Moscow in 2011 that Biden was lying about him. That's and he not knew it. So he had, he, had the, he had a stronghold on him. Absolutely. Exactly. And, and so that's what yep. you're talking about when you're saying that Putin, in, in a sense, dominates and perhaps owns Biden, even though the right. media is trying to paint a portrait of Biden as the powerful president. And that leads me to uh, to wanting to ask you that um, the media, you say, is oftentimes uh, they're paid more to cover up for Biden and to misrepresent Biden and misrepresent things that he has said and done or claims and so on, than they are to actually confront him with the fact that he is probably a liar or most likely that we just uncovered right here that uh, it was Putin that told the truth. So what is the motivation for the American media to to straight up lie to the American people? While they're covering for well, Joe Biden, I mean that's what that's what Donald Trump said for years and years, and people. I would, mean, yes, we have you know, heard it from say him he's too. Attacking the media, but they're fa- it's fake news. It's fake news. And part of what he is was the saying whole, was is the whole thing basically that. just like um, you know a series of uh, drama shows like Law and Order that they're playing right. out before the American people, and the American people believe it to be the truth while there's other things going on behind the scenes that they don't want the people to know about. Right. So for, so for instance, quick, quick point on this, this New Yorker interview on April, 2014, this guy, Evan Osnos is a writer. So that gets into print, but Evan Osnos spent about two months on that story. He goes into the white house. He interviews Obama. He interviews all these other people. He interviews Jill Biden for who's the real Joe Biden kind of story. All during that time, they could have fixed that mistake that he made. They never did. He had a he had a Joe Biden communication staffer sitting in next to him as he was doing this interview, who could have fixed that error. They never did. They let that they? lie sit out there. It's still there. It's they? still in the print. Why didn't they? Because they're recovering for Joe. They don't care. They didn't. They, they want to protect him. So here's another evidence of the uh, press covering for him. I just wrote a substack based on a trip I took with Joe Biden into Ukraine in November 2014. And I'll be following up on that with some evidence I find in the laptop of why he really did, which I think was tied into him doing business for Burisma. You were asking, how does Joe get money out of it? I'm not sure, but I, it looks based on uh, laptop emails he did this trip specifically to help Burisma. And I'll do an upcoming Substack report on that. What happens on this trip is we fly in, we, we start off in Morocco, then we go to Ukraine, then we go back to Turkey. It's very suspicious to me that we start in Morocco, we fly over the top of Turkey on our way to Ukraine. Usually White House trips, if they're well-planned, you go from one point to one point to one point. It would and make there's not sense a lot of backtrack. There's a lot of wasted time first. in the air on that trip. So I think what they did is they inserted the Ukraine stop in the middle of a pre-planned trip because Joe Biden got these emails. Hunter Biden got emails from this uh, Vadim Pazarsky, this Burisma guy in September. Hunter gets to Joe and says, hey, you got to throw in a a Burisma, uh, a a Ukraine stop. Joe tells his people and they say, oh, well, we've got all this stuff set up, but okay, we'll do in the middle of it. So they Mm -hmm. stuck this thing in the middle of this trip. Flying so into Ukraine, so me, there's a reporter on the on the plane. Ahead. What was that? I Flying was, into Ukraine, there's a reporter on the plane who was from the Voice of America. She's Ukrainian born. She starts to question in a background briefing, very specific questions. This is 2014. This is November 2014. Russia has invaded and taken over Crimea. Russia is supporting separatists in the Donbass. There's Russian tanks coming across the border. It's not a lot different than it was then 
than it is right now with their massive invasion. Not as much bloodshed, not as widespread. Still, people in Ukraine are getting killed. Right. As today. The Ukrainian reporter, her name is Miroslava Ganadze. She says, Ukrainians are telling me they're getting, we're getting killed here. What are you sending now? And I wrote a substack on this. The reply from the, the staffers, Joe Biden's communication staffers, was weak. It was what just diplo speak. They, they talked about, we're, gonna, we're working through with the Russians. They're not being cooperative. And she's saying, look, you guys haven't given them any heavy weapons. When are you going to give them heavy weapons? Well, we're not going to give them heavy weapons right away. This is 2014. So they're Who playing with them all in 2014. Along. This is a power struggle. That, that? They're playing with people's lives all along. And this goes back to 2014. Now moving up to yes, uh, 2022, they're playing with people's lives again. And this is basically from what it sounds like. It boils down to a feud between the Ukrainian leaders, Russia, and Joe Biden, and behind that, Barack Obama, too. He was working with Barack Obama at the time. They were a team. So we're talking about a handful of people that are trying to show off their muscles. Meanwhile, they're killing people in the process with no regards for human life. And we right now have three million people, over three million people um, have fled the Ukraine, which is significantly more than, and the bloodshed and the damage of buildings and so on is significantly more than it was a few years ago when they were feuding the last time. So here's the, um, here's uh, what leads up to my next question. That is Joe Biden. He is in, uh, in many respects, very much responsible for what's going on with the Ukrainian people right now. And, uh, the suffering that they are experiencing, um, in what respects should he be held accountable for that? I mean, he, he has a role in this, correct? Well, that's exactly right. And the role is, so I'll, I'll take a quick um, step back to this 2014, November 2014. So we're on the plane. This uh, Ukrainian journalist is really asking tough questions. They don't have good answers for her. And finally, the other two, um, and I named the names of the reporters, Justin Sink, now of Bloomberg, and Mike Mamoli, uh, now of MSNBC, were in the, the trio. When we land in Ukraine, there's a couple of events. Justin Sink finally, at that point in time, asked Joe Biden face to face, what about you and your son in Burisma? And at that point, Joe Biden says, I never talked business with my son, Maurice, and I was standing right there as Justin Sink asked him this question on the street in Kiev. That was a face, that was Joe Biden's, not a spokesperson, Joe Biden personally saying it. So good for Justin for doing that. But they didn't dig any further. That's where it stayed. We're, we're on the plane again, and this is what I write in the substack. The substacks I write are based on my memory, and I, and I uh, support them with documents that I find. In this case, there's a transcript of this briefing that took place on this plane. Joe Biden had a rule on Air Force Two. If he came to the back of the plane to talk to the press, it was off the record. So every once in a while, he'd come wandering back in his black turtleneck. He's a fit and trim guy. He looked, guy. He looked good you know, at the time. He jabber with the reporters, good natured here and there. So he does this on that, that trip. Because I remember Mike Mamoli was one of the reporters. Mike Mamoli asked him at one point in one of these conversations, he goes, and I don't remember exactly the question, but it was along these lines. Is Putin ever getting out of Crimea? And Joe Biden goes, and I remember this specifically very clearly, because it was contradicted everything that Obama and their administration had been saying about Crimea and Ukraine. Joe Biden looked at me and goes, this is off the record, right? And Mike Mamoli goes, yeah, it's off the record. He goes, that should be the no. first red flag. In other words, yeah, in other words, I accept that Vladimir Putin is in Crimea and it's Russian territory now. In the back of Joe Biden's mind, unofficially, that was his position. It was never reported. It was never mentioned. Do you, do you think that's his position that about in... uh, Ukraine as well today? Exactly. Because he it, doesn't, he, I no mean, one's on the surface, it. he expresses concern for the Ukrainians, but 
he doesn't really do anything. And that is very typical of, of the, how he operates, that he will say one thing, he will express concern, but in his actions dictate something quite different. Do you cut. think he has Just the like same disregard cut. for the Ukrainians as he has a track record of having for other nationalities? I don't think he has regard for anybody but himself and his family, personally. So the whole That's thing is a opinion. personal game. It's a game of politics, just like Hillary Clinton plays a game of politics. She has literally called it that when she said, I'm never going to quit the game of politics. It's the same thing with Joe Biden. And what we are experiencing here with over 3 million refugees from Ukraine and knowing that this is not going to stop anytime soon in Europe, we we hear all the time from European news, uh, they're determining or they're labeling it the war in Europe and starting to talk about it being third world war as well. This war in Ukraine and in Europe is basically a power struggle between a handful of power hungry old men. Is that what we're seeing here? Is that what people are dying for? Is that seeing. what people, 3 million people on the run for? Yeah. Let, let, let's tie what happened back then, eight years ago, into what's happening right now. So Joe Biden has a statement. He's never getting out of Crimea. What was happening in Crimea and the Donbass that these separatists were after? That's where all the natural gas deposits are in Ukraine. That's what Burisma Holdings, that was their leaseholds. That's what Burisma Holdings wanted, was they wanted control to be able to do shale drilling and shale exploration there. Now, and, and that's why they were saying back then, eight years ago, we want to have Ukraine return to its territorial integrity. Meanwhile, Joe Biden private said, no, that's never going to happen. That's what they're saying right now. Putin has said, I don't want, uh, I don't want Ukraine in NATO. I want a neutral Ukraine, and um, I want these Donbass regions to be recognized as, separate, as their own republics, and I want Crimea to be from uh, Russia. Up till now, everybody it's said about, no, It's about no, territory for them. Territorial integrity. It's about territorial power this, for I them. I think this is basically about the territory of Crimea and the Donbass. I don't know what Joe Biden is doing, but he's not sending troops in. He's not sending planes in. He's basically letting the Ukrainians. But learn he, is sending, the hard he is sending millions and mi or billions and billions of dollars out of the taxpayers' money. It's always easy cop. for he's them to he's spend taxpayers' show up money. Somehow, as a dirty cop, he's the dirty right? cop he's again. He's got to show up somehow as a dirty cop and make himself look good. So he's making himself look good with that, with taxpayers' money. But in the end, it's not going to go well for the Ukrainians. What do you foresee and happening in the near future, based on your? Uh, extensive research of Joe Biden and also working uh, six years for Joe Biden as a stenographer. You know him in, in ways that most people don't. What do you foresee happening in the near future? Because a lot of things have really happened in just three years after the war broke out. What can I, we expect? I think Joe Biden is making a deal, so quote unquote, a deal with Putin. I think the people that are suffering the worst are Ukrainians freedom-loving Ukrainians. I think that there's going to be um, a different country, Ukraine, that doesn't look as it does now. I think people, I, I don't think it'll go back to being like the, the Iron Curtain days when they had watchtowers and mined no man's lands on the border. Mm -hmm. I don't think that happens. I think there'll be you know, sort of a more open do you border think there situation is a risk, with Russia. Do you think there is a risk that the war will spread into other countries based on, on your knowledge of this? I don't, I hope not. I really hope not. I don't think so. I mean, I listened to the radio today and Jen Stoltenberg from NATO was saying, no, NATO's not going to engage in combat with Russia. And, you know, so I think... I think there's sort of a squaring off right now. And unfortunately, it's like basically Europe's looking at, okay, there's two mafia groups and there's a dirty cop. 
and we're going to stand on the sidelines and keep our noses clean and out of well, it. Well, certainly that's the, where they are. But, you know, much the, of the news uh, in Northern Europe, uh, and I speak for Denmark, we certainly don't hear in Denmark that they talk about Joe Biden as the dirty cop. The Danish media would never say that. Um, yeah. or you got to be careful with saying never. However, that's not how they're talking about him. So, um, what do you think will be the future for the, uh, so far already 3 million Ukrainians that have fled the country? Is there any, any hope for them in terms of, um, coming back to the, U to Ukraine anytime soon? Uh, and I'm talking about say three to six months or so. Or is this a displacement act of population? Is it part of the big plan? I, I don't know about a big plan. I know that um, Vladimir Putin won't live forever and Russia will change eventually. Um, I think that the world has woken up to what I call in my substack the tyranny of evil men. And the tyranny of the evil men in this is the evil of Joe Biden and the evil of Vladimir Putin. Because I think the two of them together could have resolved this diplomatically eight years ago when there was a, a journalist from Ukraine on Air Force Two saying, people are getting killed in Ukraine. What can you do? And they did nothing. What are you going Joe to Biden do about it? And he did nothing. And Vladimir Putin said, you know what? I've compromised Joe Biden. I know his son is, is dirty. I know Joe Biden is dirty. I have the upper hand, I'm gonna take the upper hand. And that's what he did when mm -hmm. he invaded Ukraine because Joe Biden is a weak president and he's a dirty cop Do you think this possibly could have happened? Do you think this could have happened had Donald Trump been in the White House at the present time? Never would have happened. And why is that? Uh, Trump had a very pragmatic approach to Putin. I mean, you know, he uh, negotiated with him as from a position of strength. He wasn't compromised by Putin. Biden's compromised. And that puts Biden on the back foot, every, everything he did. And he, he was weak with Putin. And tr Trump said that all along. Joe Biden's weak. And now we're seeing the results of what, you, what happens when you have a weak president with a very, with, you know, a, a chairman, a tyrant of uh, Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is not a, he, he's a sociopath. He is not a, a person to be admired or exemplified, but he is focused on Russian. He, he's a very he's pro Russia Russian first. Russian. He's all about Russia. He's Russia first. First, just like. And so, you know, they're, we've I think seen for years. Gonna, they go through a period in Europe where they're going to try to uh disintegrate what russia first is through a variety of channels that's kind of how joe biden and and uh tony blinken and and jake sullivan work as they try to sort of back channel things and, and you know use the media to try to pull things apart we'll see how far they go with these economic sanctions but they're not really going that far and it think, might not do very much sadly it tragically, might not do very much at all Freedom-loving Ukrainians are paying the price for Joe Biden's weakness and greed and personal corruption. We're going to round it off here. Um, I recommend for everybody out there that you subscribe, um, as you see at the bottom of the screen here, to Mac Mike McCormick's Substack. It is absolutely incredible what he has uncovered. And Mike, um, any final words? that you would like to get out to our viewers here today. And we're certainly going to have you back on again because things are happening so fast and you have such insight, such in-depth knowledge of what's going on and your analysis and interpretation is invaluable. So I thank you so much for that and for taking the time to come back on. And we do want to have you back on very soon because things are happening so fast here that um, it's hard to keep up sometime, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah, it is. Well, you know, and so final here's, words, here's so. what I'll finally say. What's important about this Substack is if you go to Google or you go to go.go and you put in Joe Biden, November 2014 briefing press people, you can put in Mike Mamoli's name, you can put in Justin Sink's name, you can put in Myroslava Ganazzi's name. It doesn't come up. 
There is a fortress being built around the history of Joe Biden's activities in the White House, in the Obama White House, by big tech and by media. They're not They're censoring publishing it. it. You won't get the truth about it. And I'm the one sitting here telling you about it because I saw it and I know where to find these things and I put it in Substack. Thank goodness for Substack being willing to publish it on the internet. You can Absolutely. get it. It's free. You can subscribe. It's free. And tell you. And I recommend people do people that. that I recommend people in Europe do that yeah. too. They should. They really should. Yeah. Substack. Absolutely. You'll see, the uncensored. I base my, my opinions on evidence that I've witnessed and evidence that I find in White House documents and in the Hunter Biden laptop. There's a lot more to come. Absolutely. We'll have you back on uh, very soon for an update on what's going on so far. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today and for all your hard work. And uh, we look forward to having you back. Thanks, and Karina. Guys out there, don't forget to get Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden unauthorized Mike McCormick's book. I read it. It's incredible. You're not going to believe much of what you read there. It, it's like a story, it seems like, but it's all true. It is the truth right there and that's exactly what you get on you and the truth as well we thank you for listening today and thank you so much again to mike mccormick for taking the time to talk with us you have just come face to face with the truth please don't forget to like subscribe share and hit that bell so you will be notified when we drop new episodes